Nineveh Medical Encyclopedia around 631 BC. Instructions for curing a headache. Shave a man's head, crush and sieve together two aromatic herbs, spurge weed, juniper, plant seed, and sea algae. Boil in beer, smear on bandage. He will recover. <laughs> a strange prescription for us accustomed to Tylenol, but attempts to heal are as old as we human beings have been around. With the healing stories in Mark's gospel, our 21st century worldview clashes with the worldview of the Bronze Age. So it's difficult to preach about them without challenging some assumptions, even offending people, maybe some of you. I know that what I'm about to say is just one way to consider this. But after wrestling with it, I offer this in faith, involving both heart and mind. Hebrew scriptures and the gospels contain stories about people being cured, even coming back from the dead. Well written, many faithful Jews and Christians assume the stories are eyewitnesses' accounts, when all of them are reflections from hindsight that deal not with objective history, but with meaning. Writers of the Gospels organized stories remembered and shared by communities of faith, so they really are highly polished, like stones tumbling in a riverbed. In Mark's story, Jesus brings Jairus' daughter back to life, a parallel to the raising of Lazarus in John's Gospel. Jesus' delay noted to state that the girl, like Nazareth, was really dead. Trouble is, the church continues to teach and preach in Bronze Age terms. So many people see little relationship in Bible or religion to their own experience of reality. I went through that too. With its don't leave your brain at the door attitude, the Episcopal Church has tried to be relevant. When I was a curate, the Sunday school curriculum for the second grade had focused on dinosaurs. No way, some say. Dinosaurs aren't even mentioned in the Bible. By biblical calculation, the earth is around 6,000 years old. I don't know if you saw this, but Carl Zimmer in the New York Times wrote, over the past 500 million years, vertebrates have evolved into a staggering variety of forms, from hummingbirds to elephants, bullfrogs to hammerhead sharks, not to mention our peculiar species of upright ape. So the question is this, are we open to new learning? Problem, evangelical Christians and many churches keep trying to theologize biology, trying to impose ancient biblical concepts onto modern science, like Southern Baptists opposing in vitro fertilization on the basis of so-called fetal personhood equating every embryo with a living child. Now, whatever your thoughts are in the sense of healing, ethical medical decisions do not belong in the sphere of politics. So why are politicians, even judges, mostly men, so eager to rule on women's health issues most men know very little about? I saw a poster, politicians, show me your medical licenses. A good question for churches too. Now, disagreements between faithful Christians and scholars continue about these healing stories in the Bible, but then that's why we Episcopalians, we get to think for ourselves. So here's my dilemma. 
if Jesus was a real human being, as the creeds affirm, and I believe, then Jesus didn't have magic healing power any more than we do. For me, the basic question is this. Was one molecule ever changed or rearranged by Jesus' words or actions? Or did Jesus know things we are just now discovering? I don't know. I don't think so. Jesus was a man of his time. And back then, people didn't understand the cause of disease, physical or mental. Mostly disease was seen as ethical failure, like the parents of the blind man who was asked, who sinned? Now we know that life, even disease, is able to exist because of the order in the universe, which is how people have found ways to prevent, sometimes cure, diseases undiagnosed for thousands of years. Think of all the people who by experiment and study, sometimes by accident, discovered how to cure tuberculosis, smallpox, some cancers, all kinds of diseases. Even AIDS is no longer an automatic death sentence. So I got to tell you, I shake my head in disbelief at people who refuse to be inoculated against COVID. Even measles and other childhood diseases are making a comeback as some parents refuse to have their children vaccinated. I mean, how stupid is that? God, evolution, whatever, gave us a brain. We can confront diseases, try to understand, prevent, even cure them. Of course, there's a lot we still don't understand about the cause of physical or mental illness, how they happen. Even as we're learning more and more about the role of genetics, which may in fact hold the key to your future health. Sadly, religion has sometimes been harmful Religion has sometimes been harmful to health. You may remember, the Mercury News reported last month on the mother, uncle, and grandparents of an eight-year-old girl who died of asphyxiation, terrible bruises all over her body. Led by the girl's grandfather, a Pentecostal minister, they tried to perform an exorcism of an evil spirit inhabiting her body. Epilepsy? Who knows? The report hasn't come out yet. Tragically, ignorance and superstition continue to play a huge role in religion. Years ago, I was confronted by a God's will assumption at Toby Hospital in Wareham, Massachusetts. The Board of Trustees had agreed to my request to designate three no smoking tables in the back of the dining room. In those days, many nurses, even some doctors, smoked cigarettes. Now the hospital had a very good kitchen. So one day, after visiting parishioners, I went downstairs for lunch. Five nurses were eating at the no smoking table all of them smoking. <laughs> the no smoking sign turned down. I approached. <laughs> you know this is a no smoking table. One of them said yes, but all the other tables were taken. Well, perhaps you could have refrained from smoking and added five minutes to your life. One of the nurses said, God will determine when I die. <laughs> Graciously, I retorted, don't blame the Lord for your bad habits. <laughs> if looks could kill, I would not be standing here. <laughs> but for better for worse, karma works. The very next day, I was scheduled for a three-hour 
blood sugar test. I walked into the room. The phlebotomist was that nurse. I thought, oh my God. I looked at her. She looked at me. We knew exactly who each other was. She could not have been more professional. At the end of three hours and 12 draws of blood, I thanked her. Smiling at my relief, she said, how about a hug? <laughs> we were friends from that day on. God heals in mysterious ways, even relationships. In 1988, I met an English vicar at St. George's College, Jerusalem. I didn't know then he was diabetic. At three o'clock in the morning after Easter day, he woke up feeling very dizzy with dangerously low blood sugar. Remembering that Jill and the dean's wife had prepared Easter baskets, he grabbed a handful of jelly beans from that basket on his bedside table and started chewing. Later that morning, he told Jill about it and thanked her. Was God involved? Is that one way God works to heal? Behind the scenes where personal, practical matters happen more than we ever imagined. Maybe we all have a role. Years later, Jill and I were staying with him and his wife at the Canterbury Cathedral School, where he was also served as vicar of a small parish nearby. Putting on his collar after dinner, he asked me if I'd like to go with him to a healing service. Oh great, I thought, Oral Roberts in the UK. But his enormous respect that I had for him, his biblical knowledge, theology, and his integrity, I agreed to go. At the beginning of that service, he said words I'd never heard, but never forgot. I'd like to remind you, he said, of the distinction between healing and curing. Curing is the prerogative of doctors and nurses, hospitals and clinics. Healing is one prerogative, a gift of the church as we seek to bring wholeness to people's lives. A man could be dying in the next five minutes, but could be healed, find wholeness, acceptance, and peace. Finally, healing and healing prayers became real, made sense to me. Now we have yet to understand the role or power of prayer, what it does, can, or can't do. I am sure it's not an attempt to change God's mind. Many years ago, a parishioner's son died of cancer. His mother told me, I prayed and prayed, but God said no. Quickly, I told her, what took his life was biological, not God. Really? At the heart of God, the author of life is order and love. And I quickly quoted from the Book of Wisdom, God is not the cause of death. At one time, the Reverend Deacon Kathy Crow told a student, God is not a vending machine. After this sermon had been revised and printed multiple times, I thought it was done. But last Friday morning, I woke up wrestling with conflicting truths. We live in mystery, a lot we don't know, but we need to be honest about what we do know. Prayer is not merely wishful thinking. We Episcopalians are not Christian scientists. Jesus taught, 
You don't pass by a person in need and say, have a nice day. You need to do something. As we pray together or separately, I imagine our prayers may contain some kind of force field that can focus and harness our energy in ways that can lead to curing in people, in creation, involving all people of goodwill, all religions. But our good thoughts have to be turned into action, build hospitals, financially support research. In the past year, my vicar friend has been through a number of surgeries for two forms of cancer. Last week, an email arrived. Doctors just pronounced me cancer free. We've been praying here for him every Sunday. His recovery involving, I think, a combination of science and faith, working together, not either or. So curing, healing, holy mysteries, both. Awesome in scope. In Mark's story, Jesus encountered the faith of that woman who had touched his clothes, her own faith transforming her situation. Jesus didn't give up on Jairus' daughter, and God doesn't give up on us. Working through our brains, scientific method, skill, caring, sometimes discovery, sometimes luck, upheld by our confidence in the order of creation, our trust in medical staff, through our loving, supportive actions, in our prayers and in our actions to bring healing, wholeness, and sometimes curing to a broken world in wonderful, diverse ways beyond our imagination.